if you're noticing patches on your skin that is turning lighter, losing skin color, or even white compared to the rest of your skin tone, then you may be dealing with a condition called vitiligo. Hi, my name is Dr. Jenny Liu. I'm a board certified dermatologist and welcome and welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today, I wanna to talk about this condition that I see not infrequently in clinic, vitiligo. What is it? Who is at risk for developing it? What you can do to treat it? As well as some new medications that are giving patients hope. So if you enjoy learning more about germ-related content, skin conditions, skincare tips, and product reviews, and I would love it if you can give this video a thumbs up. Don't forget to hit that notification button and subscribe to my channel. So vitiligo is a chronic autoimmune condition where the body's immune system that is normally responsible for keeping us safe and healthy, like fighting off bacterial and viral infections, somehow is mistakenly attacking the melanocytes in our skin and body, and therefore we're losing color and the skin and hair becomes depigmented or white. Now, vitiligo can happen anywhere, but predominantly affects our skin and hair. But technically, we have melanocytes in our inner ear even, as well as in our eyes. But it is very rare for patients to present with a loss of eye color or inner ear balance problems. That is very rare and usually presents as a syndrome. Um, but in general, patients with vitiligo, what they will see is that their skin and hair becomes gray and white and depigmented. Now, it is chronic, meaning we don't have a cure, but it doesn't mean that it can be well managed. And also with its kind of autoimmune tendency, it does mean that there is a genetic predisposition. And so individual that is at risk of having vitiligo tends to develop other types of autoimmune conditions. Like most commonly, it's associated with a condition called alopecia areata, a type of hair loss. In fact, I actually frequently see the two together in the same person, as well as a thyroid disease or even type one diabetes. So when a patient presents a clinic and seeing me for the first time for concerns of vitiligo, I'll often ask them about hair loss, thyroid disease, type one diabetes, whether in themselves or running in the family. So common signs and symptoms of vitiligo. If vitiligo itself in general is not symptomatic, meaning the skin isn't like really painful, it doesn't burn or itch. What often bring people in is just that they've noticed this patch that's white or depigmented kind of gradually or maybe all of a sudden appearing one day. There are various different patterns and configurations that vitiligo can present, but usually it tends to be symmetric and can involve the skin, like the eyelids, the lips, the fingers, back of the hands, elbows, knees, shin, the feet, even the belly button, um, armpits, body fold areas and even the hair follicles can be involved. So patients may even notice um, you know, eyelashes, eyebrow, or even patches of hair that is white or gray in color. And I would say as far as like the progression, most people tend to come in with few patches here and there. It is very rare for someone to bam, all of a sudden one day just wake up completely depigmented. And you know, as far as like the the pro progression, that's also variable, kind of, again, going back to that genetic tendency, but I would say majority of the people kind of have a slower progression where they may, some people may just have a few patches and that's all they would experience their entire life. Some people may start off with a few patches and over time gradually develop a few. And like I said, very few people will have the extreme end where they come, become very quickly depigmented or have more vitiligo patches than normal skin. That certainly can happen, and I do have a few patients that have that. In fact, I actually frequently talk to patients like Michael Jackson. He had vitiligo. He had a, the autoimmune condition, and he had more vitiligo patches than normal skin tone, which is why he chose to actually permanently bleach his skin, which can be actually a reasonable treatment option, which we will discuss in a little bit. But most frequently, patients would just come in noticing white patches here and there on their face or body. So the million dollar question I get is, why me and why now? And that is something we don't of course have an answer to like many dermatologic conditions but we do know it's the marriage it's a combination of genetic tendency and somehow there is an environmental trigger and bam which is why you are all of a sudden noticing these patches on your skin that genetic tendency just means that in your DNA, you have that predisposition to developing vitiligo, and then along the way, somehow 
something triggered it and now your immune system is finally attacking it. Whereas before, they were just kind of like sleeping, if you will, and now they're woken up by this trigger. That genetic tendency can be in yourself already. Like many patients of mine that come in with vitiligo often will have already pre-existing maybe alopecia areata, thyroid disease, or type 1 diabetes, or have that tendency running in the family, like in mom, dad, or sibling. Or one of the things I often do with my vitiligo patients when they come to see me for the first time is do a very thorough review of systems or even check labs, specifically thyroid labs, to make sure that they're not hypothyroid. Um, but yes, there often is that genetic tendency and then the trigger. And the trigger tends to be environmental and it could be illness, it could be stress, sometimes medications. Sometimes we even think about oxidative stress. We don't know, but somehow there is this external stress that basically woken up the immune system and somehow your immune system is recognizing the melanocytes, mistakenly recognizing them, attacking them, which is why your skin and hair is losing color. Now, one thing I do want to emphasize for the patients that do have just isolated vitiligo, it doesn't mean that your immune system is bad or it's not functioning right. It's just misbehaving, if you can think of that. But it doesn't mean that it's not able to fight off infections. And aside from the high risk of developing other common autoimmune conditions, it is one of those things where if it's just vitiligo itself, some patients of mine will choose even not to treat it because it's not bothersome in the sense vitiligo if you are careful with your skin and protecting your skin because it doesn't have skin color it itself really doesn't need to be treated in fact many of my fair skin patients who already have fair skin at baseline and the white vitiligo patches are very hard to even notice contrasting against their fair skin some of them choose not to treat at all. Now, certainly the story is very different if you have darker skin tone and a lot of the treatment is in many ways cosmetic. We know that vitiligo itself can greatly affect someone's self-esteem, self-image, but the vitiligo patches themselves are not dangerous. They're not at high risk for developing, for example, infections, and they're definitely by no means contagious. So let's talk about treatment or the relevance of having vitiligo. Now remember, the importance of having melanocytes in our skin and hair is to protect our skin from UV damage. When you don't have pigment, essentially what that means is your skin really loses all kind of the protective mechanism. That means the skin that is affected by vitiligo really is at high risk of burning and thereby skin damage and much higher risk of developing skin cancer. I think that is really worth emphasizing is that vitiligo itself is not dangerous, but having vitiligo on your skin just increases your skin's risk of sun damage and skin cancer. So even if you choose not to treat it, you still have to take the precautions and protect your skin. So with that, that means strict sun protection, sunscreen all the time, sun protective clothing. But if you are interested in treating it, this is what you can talk to your dermatologist about. There is now a range of topical as well as oral medications that can be effective depending on the amount of vitiligo that you have as well as how comfortable you are with all of these treatments. So let's take a deeper dive into all of them. So first, the standard therapy has always been topical corticosteroids. Now remember, corticosteroids are anti-inflammatory. So what we're doing essentially is when you apply corticosteroids on your skin, you are basically trying to dull or tell the immune cells to, hey, like you need a timeout, you need to kind of behave better. And so it's anti-inflammatory. So shutting down the immune cells so that way your pigment cells do have some time to recover and grow back. And so that's usually the mainstay. And that's always been what we've been giving to patients ever since until recently, a new FDA prescription medication has approved. Now, Corticosteroids have worked really well. New medications are expensive. It doesn't mean they're better, but certainly it def definitely gives patients more opportunity for treatment. But corticosteroids usually is what we give to patients, especially if they just have isolated patches. And then there's also topical calcineur inhibitors. So these are the medications called Protopic or Eladel by brand name. And they work like corticosteroids, but don't have the side effects, if you will, with long-term use. So that could be skin thinning or causing acne. And those are great 
products or I was I should say medications to use um, kind of as maintenance or even alternating with your corticosteroids I often will even have my patients like use corticosteroids like Monday through Friday and then the topical calcineur inhibitors on the weekend or say really hitting hard with the topical steroids and then using the um, calcineur inhibitors as like maintenance there's a lot of different regimens and this is very much kind of like a recipe where you and your dermatologist would come up with but those usually have have been the mainstays for treatment when the patches are isolated and fairly few and not as spread out or diffuse. And now for the first time, there is an FDA approved medication for vitiligo and it's called Upsilera. It is a topical cream that inhibits JAK kinase. So this is just a particular pathway in the inflammatory cells that attack your pigment and basically kind of, again, dulling the immune system, telling them to behave better, but works a little differently than the corticosteroids and also the side effects. It's not common like causing skin thinning or acne. It is newer and newer medication tends to be more expensive and less likely to be covered by insurance in general, but it definitely gives patients options. Now, as far as my personal experience, I would say I often just have patients kind of rotate through them, all of them. Newer medications, gives hope. It doesn't necessarily mean it's better, but it's just another option for patients that is in our toolbox to prescribe as well. So, and that is kind of the topical things that we normally would get. Now let's talk about what happens when you have a lot of vitiligo, or if you want to do something more beyond the creams, if they're not working. So first of all, one mainstay treatment that's kind of been old school, but works really well is phototherapy. So narrow band UVB treatment. So this is a very well controlled narrow band and UVB wavelength of light, that is medical grade, I call it. And the scent has not been shown to cause cancer. It is not the same thing as tanning bed. It is very safe, it's anti-inflammatory. We use it for a lot of treatments, including vitiligo, eczema, psoriasis, and other inflammatory skin conditions. But it is time consuming in the sense patients do have to come into a dermatology office. They kind of undress, protect their eyes, and then basically shine their skin in this light box for a certain amount of time. And they normally do this two to three times a week. And then again, it kind of is very similar to the topical creams in the sense the light is immunomodulating. It's kind of dulling, dulling the immune cells, telling them to behave a little bit better and then over time, allowing your pigment to come back. It is a great therapy to use with topical creams. In fact, the two together is often what I would prescribe and most dermatologists would prescribe to individuals that have a little bit more diffuse ex uh, vitiligo or say is not getting better with the creams alone. The light treatment can be a great adjunct to kind of boost the treatment even further. And then similarly, there are laser called eczema laser that basically have the same wavelength of light as band UVB. The laser is more powerful and basically is great not treating the whole body area, but if you have a few stubborn patches, it is great at targeting those stubborn areas and helping the pigment to come back. And so that's another treatment. Again, Neuroband UVB phototherapy is really great for individuals that maybe aren't excited about taking oral medications because of the side effects and have a little bit more diffuse vitiligo um, and want to do that along with the creams. Eczema laser would be great to pair with creams as well, but more targeted towards individuals that have like localized stubborn areas that are going to be more effective or just haven't been responding to treatments and they kind of want to do something else in addition. And then not to get too medical on you guys, but there are oral medications that your dermatologist can prescribe, including like oral jack kinase inhibitors. Now, oral medications do come with more side effects, but at the same time, they can offer better improvement. So this is where just talking to your provider, knowing the risks and benefits, what makes sense for you. A lot of times these treatments are often combined to give the best results. And sometimes for the same patient, it may be even trialing different things to see what your skin responds best. But it is not unheard of, and I commonly would do this for my patients, where we give topical things a try, not working so well, then we give you know phototherapy or maybe even add on an oral medication. So understanding what is best for you and understanding the risks and benefits, that is the most important. And finding the treatment regimen that makes sense for you. And then there are also surgical options like skin grafting. Those often are not covered by insurance. Usually there are side effects with the surgery where you take normal skin and put them into skin where they're, it's affected by vitiligo and hopefully that kind of normal skin will start to grow out and repigment. And then lastly, I want to briefly talk about 
skin bleaching in the sense for patients that have more vitiligo patches than normal skin tone. One option, like what Michael Jackson did, is to completely bleach the skin tone. Um, you know, when we talk about treating vitiligo, I always tell my patients, we hope, we pray to get all the pigment to come back. But realistically, if we can get 90% of it to come back, that is our goal, like 70, 90%. I think when it comes to treatment, having that expectation is really important because no one can guarantee that all the pigment is gonna come back. It's really hard to, and even if you do get all the pigment to come back, your body with that genetic tendency, you may develop vitiligo patches down the road in other places. So this is where if you have very widespread vitiligo, the normal skin tone, you can certainly bleach your skin. There is a compounded 20% hydroquinone essentially that dermatologists can prescribe to patients. And if you use it on your skin regularly, it will kind of basically kill off the melanocytes and cause you to depigment in areas where you have skin tone. So understand that, you know, obviously there are a lot of ethical considerations. The patient, you have to feel very comfortable, not just knowing that you're going to be a completely different skin color potentially, but also the side effects of using this cream. And also understand that this cream is not like a one-time done deal. You have to keep using it because your skin color, some areas will actually start to repigment over time. And so this is one of those things where just talking to your dermatologist, what makes sense for you, depending on the severity and the degree of vitiligo that is affecting you and your self-esteem, finding a dermatologist that you trust and coming up with a treatment that you're comfortable doing. And then lastly, as I mentioned, lifestyle habits. This is probably by far the most important. You really want to make sure that you're protecting your skin from the sun. And that means a daily sunscreen wearing on your face, on your body, wherever it's affected. Some protective clothing is also a must along with a wide brim hat if that vitiligo is affecting your skin. There are a lot of great options for face and body, including some of my favorites like La Roche Posay and Helios. Alta MD makes really nice ones. I will make sure to link a few favorite SPF videos below in the description box. But this is where you are one individual who really should be wearing sunscreen every single day because your skin does not have the inherent protective mechanisms to protect itself from UV damage. And on the same time too, in the summertime, it doesn't mean you have to shy away from the sun, but just being smart about it along with, you know, sunscreen, some protective clothing. I also recommend my patients to take like, um, polypodium leucotomus, which is a fern extract that can reduce UVB damage and sunburn on skin. So just being mindful, being careful, but doesn't mean that you have to avoid or be afraid of the sun. All right, guys, I hope you found this video helpful. I've been trying to sneak in a few of these educational skin condition videos into my series just because I see them a lot and I frequently get asked about it. And so if you do find it helpful, let me know. Please comment below because that will help me a lot. And also let me know what other skin conditions or hair conditions you want me to talk about next. As always, thank you so much for watching. I will see you next time.